Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event on partisan science and other fundamentalisms with our very distinguished guest, Professor Gary Saul Morrison of Northwestern University. Our program this evening is the fourth and final program of a spring term series of programs at St. Olaf College on contemporary controversies. My name is Edmund Santuri. I'm a professor at St. Olaf College and Morrison Family Director of the College's Institute for Freedom and Community, the institute sponsoring tonight's event and the spring series just mentioned. The purpose of St. Olaf's Institute for Freedom and Community is to stimulate and support free inquiry and meaningful debate of important political and social issues among students, faculty, staff, alums, and the larger public. By exploring diverse ideas about politics, markets, and society, the Institute aims to challenge presuppositions, question easier, comfortable answers, and foster constructive civil dialogue among those with differing values and contending points of view. Thanks to all who have helped organize our event tonight. To remind our virtual audience members, you are invited to submit a question at any point during the discussion this evening by using the Participate tab on the streaming page. Our guest tonight, Gary Saul Morrison, is the Lawrence B. Dumas Professor of Arts and Humanities and a Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Northwestern University. As author or editor of 20 books, he has considered, among other things in his work, the nature of time, the role of quotations in culture, the novel and utopia as literary genres, the history of European and Russian thought, and his favorite writers, Chekhov, Dostoevsky, and Tolstoy. He has won Best Book of the Year awards from the American Comparative Literature Association and the American Association of Teachers of Slavic and Eastern Euro East European Languages. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Together, together with Northwestern University President Morton Shapiro, he has published two utterly fascinating books, Sense and Sensibility, that's C-E-N-T-S and Sensibility, What Economics Can Learn from the Humanities, and most relevant to our topic tonight, Minds Wide Shut, How the New Fundamentalisms Divide Us. He has recently completed a comprehensive study of the Russian literary and intellectual tradition entitled Wonder Confronts Certainty, How Russian Writers Address the Ultimate Questions and Why Their Answers Matter. There is a lot more to be said about Professor Morrison's stellar career, but for now, Professor Gary Saul Morrison, thanks very much for being with us this evening. Thank you for having me, and thank you for such a generous introduction. Welcome. Uh, Gary, our topic tonight is partisan science and other fundamentalisms. As we've noted in our introduction, you are an eminent scholar of Russian literature and intellectual history, and a prominent public intellectual with big time street cred in the humanities and perhaps too in the social sciences. I've enjoyed, for instance, your recent uh, highly public fencing with another Russian literary historian, Vladimir Alexandrov, in recent issues of the widely read New York Review of Books on the nature of Russian terrorism in the early part of the 20th century. And I would love sometime to be able to talk to you about that. But our topic tonight, Gary, is partisan science and other fundamentalisms. And the term science here has reference to the natural sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, epidemiology, and their role in public policy. As impressive an intellectual as you are in the humanities and the social sciences, what positions you exactly to talk about science, understood here as natural science, when you're not a natural scientist yourself? <clears throat> well, that's a very good question. And I'm not so much talking about <clears throat> science as the claim of science, that when people claim to have science and don't, that is, I'm really talking about pseudoscientific claims. You know, I started out many years ago um, aspiring to be a physicist, and I switched to the history of ideas. <clears throat> and one of the ideas that absolutely fascinated me was the ambition to construct a social science. You know, when Isaac Newton explained the amazingly complex movement of the planets in terms of four simple physical laws, you know, very simple equation, you could do them in basic algebra, um, it so impressed people that they thought, well, if we can do it for, for astronomy, we should be able to do it for society, for psychology, for ethics. For human and 
ever since then, these moral Newtonians, as one intellectual historian has called them, have constructed literally dozens of supposed sciences of human affairs. Um, you know, the, the man who invented the discipline of sociology originally called his discipline social physics instead of sociology. Uh, you know, uh, in our time, we've had, you know, Freudians thought they had a, a hard science. <clears throat> B.F. Skinner thought he had a hard science, you know, behavior. And people, numerous economists have thought they actually had a hard science. And among those, the most important, perhaps the most influential pseudoscientist who ever lived was Karl Marx, and who claimed that he wasn't just a philosopher or a politician, that his views were actually based, were hard science. Indeed, they were more certain than physics. So that when, when this, in the Soviet period, which is you know one of my specialties, um, if a theory of physics or chemistry or biology came into apparent conflict with Marxist-Leninist ideology, it was the physicists and chemists who had to yield. So for example, you know, there was a theory in chemistry, it's taught in basic chemistry classes that called resonance, that certain molecules, you can't draw a single diagram of them because they resonate between different possibilities. <clears throat> well, that was denounced as against Marxist-Leninism, because in Marxist-Leninism, there's a certain answer to everything and you can know it. This means as you can't, so it must be wrong. So it's my fascination with the ways in which this, such claims of science, which are bogus, but felt to be really true by the people who believe it. And what is the mentality that has sustained this kind of pseudoscientific thinking now for close to three centuries and has horrible effects on culture and society. That's really how I got into it, <clears throat> through pseudoscience, you know, through the history of ideas. But I'd also mention that, you know, there's a presupposition to your question, which is, is that, you know, it's a notion of who has the authority to speak. Well, you know, if there's one thing that science depends on, it's that the argument for, from authority doesn't count for anything. Right. In science and mathematics, you have to prove something. You can't just say, as they did in the Middle Ages, Aristotle said so, and therefore it's true. The, so it's odd that, you know, the argument from authority, we use authorities as shortcuts. That is, well, okay, we don't have the time to go into it, so we're going to trust, but it's not because the authority says so that it's true. If it were, it wouldn't be science. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, this sort of uh, leads us into the next question. Last fall, you published an article in the Wall Street Journal entitled Partisan Science in America. Uh, and that article was a principal inspiration for our inviting you to speak uh, on this topic uh, this evening. I mean, could you say a bit about the arguments you offer uh, in that article and the kinds of considerations um, you were advancing there? Yes, <clears throat> well, I'll just answer that. You know, in all these newspaper articles, the, the titles are never chosen by the author. It was the Wall Street Journal who, who chose that, that title. Um, but what I was really interested in was <clears throat> why it is reasonable that so many people are losing faith in the people who speak for science and how bad that is, because we really need people to believe, you know, to take science seriously. And if the people whom we entrust to speak more um, are not careful to make claims that they can actually sustain scientifically and well people will justifiably lose faith because they can't go into the science themselves so they have to trust the people who speak for it and if those people want for example when you know it's early in the pandemic you remember um dr fauci said that masks <clears throat> do no good. And a month later, he said, well, I only said that because we had a shortage of masks and I wanted to save the people who really need it. Once the authority says, I lied for political reasons, doesn't he realize that people are going to ask, and are you lying again for political reasons? You see, it, it's something like that, that and, and there were many such incidents that made um, people justifiably suspicious. And it's so important that people do really believe the science that when the spokesman discredit it, you know, I, you know, as someone who was, could not be more devoted to, to hard science, um, find it very distressing. Um, one of the things I was interested in was, though, how can a person who is not an expert 
in a given field, no, without knowing anything about the field, that a pseudoscientific claim is being made, even if spoken by a scientist. And that there are various ways in which you can you can tell. They, they won't exhaust everything, but they're they're so common that you know I, I could go through them for you if you like, one after another, that you would know for certain that this is not a scientific claim, even if it pretends to. Could you give an example? Well, well, for example, um, science changes. <clears throat> So some things, it's not, you know, like theology, which can be fixed for centuries and is not open to disconfirmation by evidence. The whole point of science is that some things are been very well established, like Newton's laws, let's say, for centuries, and, you know, have been countless verification, and some are new and are clearly on the frontier and may change and are considerably less certain. And indeed, it's a challenging those things on the frontiers that make science change. If it didn't, it would stay still. So when someone presents to you science as if it were a solid block where everything is equally certain and nothing can be questioned, then you know that they are not understanding science, they're treating it as theology. That would be one explanation. There's always got to be degrees of certainty. And if people are not telling you the degrees of certainty, then, and claiming everything is a solid block, then they're misleading you. That would be one. Yeah, and I think that, as, as I'm recalling from the article, you gave as an instance uh, contemporary uh, debates about environmental science. Could, could, you get, could you sort of elaborate that a little bit as an instance of the sort of thing you're talking about here? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the basis, <coughs> bases of environmental science <coughs> are very, extremely well established. And the kind of reasoning that has led people <coughs> to, you know, wonder about um, climate change, global warming, <clears throat> are really fundamental scientific discoveries like the greenhouse effect. <clears throat> and I, it would be extremely difficult to imagine something <clears throat> so well established being shaken. But then there have been particular predictions <clears throat> based on computer models as to how much temperatures would rise <clears throat> in a given number of years, given current trends, that have proven to be disastrously wrong, completely wrong. Well, if you claim that all of science is a solid block, then, then that would mean that if these are wrong, the greenhouse effect is wrong. But it's not true. It's that the predictions were based on impartial, you know, in, incomplete information. You don't, we don't know all the feedback mechanisms. We don't, we only are guessing certain things. So, you know, recently, you know, the, it got a lot of publicity. Um, there was a sign in Glacier Natural Park, you know, put up many years ago saying that by the year 2020, there would be no glaciers left. And of course, there was no visible change. And somebody got the, you know, you want to take this sign down now because it's 2022. Um, and they did. That's, an, you know, an example of one aspect of the science is very well established and others less so and others still less so. <clears throat> you know, um, for example, those particular predi the predictions on, you know, how much... Uh, you know, what the, how much sea levels will rise what the, in, in a given amount of time. Those are clearly guesses, and that's why they've been proven wrong. They're not groundless guesses. They're based on something, but they're not based on the same sort of kind of certainty that, let's say, our knowledge of the greenhouse effect is based on. Um, yeah. Uh, so what you're suggesting here is that um, uh, a mark of a pseudoscientific claim is to claim that an entire, uh, as you say, the, an entire block of uh, claims associated with, say, for example, uh, environmental science uh, are impregnable, they can, they're beyond revision, that sort of thing. Um, even as you might acknowledge that there are some bases of, uh, that undergird particular claims which you think are pretty uh, reasonably held. Um, no matter what the circumstances. So, um, okay, uh, stepping back a bit, but commenting a little bit on this, uh, you often characterize uh, uh, in your book, uh, written with Shapiro, partisan science as one of a number of fundamentalisms. Um, now, when we, I think when most people hear the word fundamentalism, they're inclined to associate it with religion. So, for example, Christian evangelicals or uh, Islamic fundamentalists are worldviews that come to mind immediately uh, when one hears the term uh, fundamentalist. 
Uh, these are groups, among others, that appeal to ultimate authority, scripture or the will of God, or the pronouncements of some religious authority, appeals that permit no debate, no open inquiry, no testing and revision. When people say, talk about fundamentalism, we have that kind of intransigence in mind. But when we think of science, uh, we think of open inquiry, testing and revision, forming hypotheses tentatively, uh, testing whether they're true through experimentation. I mean, how it seems a bit of a stretch to characterize any form of science, whether partisan or not, as fundamentalist. So what, I mean, what, what exactly do you mean by fundamentalism and how does science in certain of its expressions count as a fundamentalism? No, no, you, you misunderstood me. Science is not a fundamentalism. It's the pseudoscience and abuse of science that can be a, a fundamentalism. And you've given the reason why science is real science is open inquiry. Um, we adopted the term fundamentalism. We gave it our own definition, so it wouldn't be restricted, let's say, to religion, to a certain kind of mindset. Um, you've stated one aspect of it. You know, for example, it's true of atheist movements like <clears throat> Marxist-Leninism, one of my specialties. Um, absolutely nothing could ever shake. <clears throat> there can be no counter evidence. If it looks like counter evidence, it's wrong or it's a fraud, right? Um, so you know in advance <clears throat> that the what is certain and absolutely certain and it can't be shaken. That's one of the examples, one of the characteristics. Another one would be, um, you know, in religion they call this the perspicuity of truth, but non-religious people have it too. That is, if you just look at the world, it's obvious, it's perfectly clear what the truth is. Um, so it, it, there's no difficulty in it. That's why everything can be equally certain. So, science does not work this way. And one of the signs you can tell a pseudoscience is when they treat it as a fundamentalism. So that, for example, you know, uh, I read right now that in the paper today that there's a bill before the California legislature that would make it a doctor could lose his, li his or her license if they at any point disagreed with the consensus on, you know, the, regarding the pandemic or, or, or some other matters. Um, well, you know, many of the early treatments, like <clears throat> using ventilators as opposed to, you know, less invasive uh, nasal tube, the initial ones turned out to be wrong. <laughs> and some of the things that other physicians suggested would be worth trying turned out to be right. You know, it looked like this. people were suggesting early on that maybe these, uh, the virus spreads by aerosol. So six feet isn't quite a good idea. It's not enough. That turned out to be right. If this law were passed, you know, it's based on the notion that everything is equally certain, and therefore can't be questioned. Then none of these discoveries could have been made because the doctors wouldn't have dared say them. They'd have lost their license. This is an example of fundamentalist thinking applied to science, but which is not only not science, but impedes science. But in this case, you're talking about a piece of legislation. Is that me? That that sounds to me. Correct me if I'm wrong. That sounds to me like politics having gone wrong in trying to establish uh, parameters for scientific thinking. That doesn't strike me as an instance of, unless I'm misunderstanding, an instance of uh, science having gone wrong. Again, science has not gone wrong. Scientists go wrong, but science doesn't go wrong. I mean, there's a scientist, for example, writing, you know, um, to the Journal of the American Medical Association, advocating this uh, policy, saying that if it violates the First Amendment, the First Amendment should go for public health reasons. Um, but they may be scientists, but they're not not speaking scientifically. They're speaking from a particular political point of view. Scientists are human, like everybody else. So not everything they, a scientist says is science. This, by the way, one of the things that makes scientists um, a common error among scientists. They think that because they are scientists, everything they say is science. So if they want to talk about politics, that's certain too, or economics, um, because they're scientists after all. That, that's another good sign of a, a pseudoscience, right? When the idea is that because a scientist says it, it must be science, um, even if it's not you know, in anything that the scientist has verified you know, scientifically. That, that's another good sign of it. But again, the problem here is not science. The problem is people who claim to speak for science, some of whom are politicians, some of whom may be scientists themselves. The, um, 
uh, in your book, you've got a real interesting uh, discussion of the way in which the appeals to science uh, serve um, uh, as, as a kind, in a kind of religious way. Um, um, uh, that, uh, you know, if, if someone claims in the culture that this is a scientific claim, there is a kind of deep deference to that sort of claim that, um, uh, that reminds one <laughs> of deference to religious authority and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, could you say a little bit more about that, the way in which uh, the larger culture, I, I, may think, I may think, for example, uh, I think the garden variety understanding, say, among undergraduates, um, is on the one hand, you've got hard knowledge. Hard knowledge is happening in the scientific realm, all right? You've got truth, you've got right answers and wrong answers. But then when you get into literature or you get into history and that sort of thing, um, uh, you know, it's, it's vague, it's a matter of opinion, it's all subjectivity. I mean, th there is a certain kind of, I suppose, positivism reigning in the culture. And part of this positivism uh, does treat scientific pronouncements and scientific authorities as, as having a certain kind of hard knowledge status uh, that other fields of inquiry uh, do not have. Um, and in your book, you, you seem to make the claim that uh, in a certain sense, there's something religious about how the culture approaches science and treats science as opposed to other modes of inquiry. Is that a proper interpretation of what uh, you advance in the book? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't want to um, be represented as saying that, <clears throat> that scientific knowledge is not, in some sense, more established and, in some sense, fundamentally different from humanities or the social sciences. The social sciences are not sciences you know, um, uh, in that sense. But the claim, it's so, just because science has achieved so much, it is so tempting to claim that something is science when it isn't. Look, in the Middle Ages, you know, if you wanted to shut down argument, people like, love to shut down argument. They don't want to answer people. You know, you know, the parent who says, because I said so, that's the explanation. They, Grown-ups do that too. In the Middle Ages, you know, if you wanted to just shut down objections, you would say you had a revelation from God, and anyone who disagreed must be from the devil, right? Well, you can't make that appeal in contemporary society. The equivalent appeal is to claim that something is science, and then anybody who doesn't accept it is automatically ruled out of court because they're anti-science. But that's not science. You know, I think about that. In, in my neighborhood, there are lawn signs where people say, here, we believe in science. Science is not something you believe in. I mean, think about it. If somebody said, I believe in the Pythagorean theorem, there'd be something a little peculiar about that, wouldn't there? You don't believe in it. It's proven. It's not a matter of belief. You believe in things that, that aren't proven. This is not a matter of belief, you, you understand. It's sometimes a misunderstanding of science. And the false claim of science is, is what is really the problem and it, it shakes people's faith in real science and you'd hope that the scientists would be the ones who when you know politicians make pseudoscientific claims would be the ones who stand up and object but no if the politicians say accord with the the scientists own political prejudices they they are quiet or if they're not quiet it's because they're afraid of being you know the sort of things that the ostracism or punishment that the California legislature, you know, um, would imply, you know, and so they are neglecting one of their fundamental duties, which is to clarify for the public when a claim is scientific and when a claim is, well, maybe inspired by science, maybe loosely grounded in science, but not science itself. That's what they really need to clarify. And they're falling down on the job, not all of them, but by and large. Yeah, and another expression of uh, the culture's um, celebrating science um, in a way that reminds, at least in certain moments, of religion uh, is this idea, look, if we're going to solve our problems, we've got to, in, in some large sense of, of what our social problems are, one has, to, one has to consult what scientists are saying about uh, any number of these larger social problems. That's the place one goes for the real solution to the social problems that we face. But one of the claims that you make in your book 
uh, and it reminds of uh, other traditional thinkers and thinking about the relationship between science and other forms of knowledge, is that there is one thing that science, properly understood, cannot deliver, and that is meaning. Science, um, uh, science can tells you, tell you what is the case, but it can't really tell you how you ought to live, how you ought to come to terms with what is the case, and directions that you ought to go in, and that sort of thing. And so um, uh, science then, those who claim that science is the be-all and the end-all for addressing our social problems, are treating science as something more than it can be, and there's something religious about that. Is that a fair reading of the, some of the things you're seeing in the book? Yes, yeah, yeah, so I'm not sure it's, it's so much religious as a really misunderstanding of science. Look, when we talk about social problems, you're not talking about physics anymore. You're not talking about chemistry. You're talking about things that have not been made into a science. There is no science. You know, sociology can call itself a science all at once. We all know it isn't, right? Um, you know, let, let me tell you a story. Years, m many years ago, when there were two Germanys, you know, in East Germany and in West Germany, I had trouble remembering, was the German Democratic Republic the West Democratic one? And was the Federal Republic the Communist one? And then I suddenly realized the one that has to call itself democratic isn't. Now think for a moment. We have one discipline called physics and another called political science. Which is the science? perfectly clear that the social sciences are not sciences, and so they cannot claim that authority in solving problems, and the hard sciences don't have a social content. If the scientist claims they do, then they're stepping outside their science and they're, they're just mouthing their political opinions. When you, were, when you say political science, sociology, social psychology, what have you, the, the social sciences are not scientific, what exactly, what, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, can they make <clears throat> verifiable predictions? <clears throat> not not very well. Not much more better than the than the rest of us. You know, you say that about, you know, um, you say that about of art experiments. No, I mean there are no. What are the science? What are the, the scientific laws that work like physics that you know are continually developing progress on so that you get more and more certain with there is there isn't really anything like eh, there may be some things in, in the kinds of linguistics that are based in the brain uh, which urge on natural science um but you know think of, think of macroeconomics you know we constantly were told this is science and it turns wrong and they have to change the theory every few years but now this time we've got the science because we can predict Yes, we were wrong. Our predictions of what would happen were wrong, but now we can retrodict predicting what did happen. Yes, but the test of the test of a prediction is whether you can predict in the future, not whether you can explain something that happened. Astrology can do that, right? So none of the uh, the, the social science disciplines have achieved that kind of status, and you know, basically everybody knows it, right? Well, when I've talked to economists recently, I'm not an economist myself. I mean, I, I often hear claims that the, the discipline is, be, is becoming more mathematicized. Um, there's a kind of precision and uh, clarity uh, and focus to the discipline that it has lacked in previous generations and that sort of thing. I mean, it, do you not credit uh, that kind of development in the direction of something we would call uh, a little more scientific than it has been? say, in the days of Marx or something like that? And how many equations are there in Darwin's Origin of Species? The answer is zero. There's no mathematics there. Look, you've made a, a logical fallacy. Because physics uses mathematics, if I use more mathematics, then I'm a science like physics. And that's a, that's a reasoning from the converse. Look, if I wanted to, I've actually done this to, to make, make a point, I can state you know, uh, write equations in literary criticism, you know, or literary theory in, in mathematical terms, and I can solve them. It, but, but it's nonsense. It doesn't add anything. It just, you know, mathematics <clears throat> doesn't itself make a science, even though many sciences use a lot of math. You know, there's, there's a fundamental, you know, <clears throat> the idea that you can, by just counting something, you become scientific. 
you know, by writing an equation is a very primitive error. Okay, interesting. So we get that the sense then that um, the social sciences, in your view, are not genuine uh, sciences. Um, uh, in, in, I'm not a skeptic. Yeah, I'm not uh, a skeptic. They really are genuine sciences. Um, in the book, um, the centerpiece of the book is a larger reflection on fundamentalism as you've characterized it in general terms. And we, up to now, we've been talking about uh, religious fundamentalism and then pseudoscience as a form of fundamentalism. But your book, in your book, you treat fundamentalism as a larger cu cultural and social problem. Uh, what, how would you characterize that general problem in our society? What, what's, what's going on in your view that is pernicious and needs to be revised and rethought because it's fundamentalistic in character? Well, this is, of course, apart from the question of, of pseudoscience, because uh, the, the problem of what I'm calling fundamentalism here goes far beyond that. It's the idea that we have the absolute truth and so anyone who disagrees must be evil or stupid. This is precisely what Soviet totalitarianism was based on. And they really believed it. They really believed they had the absolute truth, both morally and scientifically. Um, and therefore, if that's the case, if you have the absolute truth, there is no reason for freedom of speech. You don't, you don't allow people to tell untruths. There's no reason to have um, two political parties you immediately tend to a one a one party state democracy is based on the notion that you just might be wrong that people have been certain and turned out to be wrong and that therefore it's important that there be a, a feedback mechanism that you know power can shift that counter arguments can be raised but if you think things are as certain as mathematics or physics you don't allow that or if you're a fundamentalist, think you have the absolute truth, then you don't allow, and we are tending, what we see with, you know, cancel culture and suppression of free speech on campuses and elsewhere, um, is that I see us moving in the horrible direction that was the Soviet Union. <clears throat> and there is no limit to the horror that comes from that. Because once you are right, um, and, and the other people are evil, you can literally do anything to any of them, because they're just evil, right? Um, there's no limit to that. And people who you know feel very self-righteous now about some belief and want to shut down debate, they may be the ones who in a few years, as happened in Russia, find themselves the, the ones arrested. And you, are, uh, you see this as a general problem on contemporary campuses today in higher education? I see it beyond campuses. I see it in our society you know, at large. You know, but on campuses, look, you know, when I took my first trip to the Soviet Union in late 1960s, and um, I remember talking to a uh, Soviet school teacher. Of course, at that point, everybody you met had been vetted by the secret police, so it wasn't a person on the street. Um, and, you know, as a young man, I said, well, you see, the problem here is you don't have any freedom of speech. And she replied, of course, we have perfect freedom of speech. We just don't let anybody lie. And who decides what's a lie? Well, the government decides what's a lie, right? Well, I tell this story now to students, and they don't get the joke. They don't see why it's funny. You know, we have free speech. We don't allow people to lie. It's becoming increasingly that that is, yeah, well, so, okay, we don't allow people to lie. That is, disagree with us. Then you wind up, you know, in a society very much like that. Very quickly. It's not, a, I, I don't see this as, you know, something which, you know, we have to worry about in the long term future. I see this danger within the, you know, <clears throat> within my lifetime, and I'm quite old. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, now might be a good time to uh, move to uh, some general Q&A from our audience. Uh, this, is in, this includes questions submitted online uh, beforehand or uh, are sub being submitted in real time through our live feed. But we also got some pre-recorded video questions. Uh, keep, it, keep in mind that these are uh, recorded, um, so you can't engage in give and take with the person answering, uh, posing the question. So let's start with the first video question from Cully Hauk. Good evening, Dr. Morrison. My name is Cully Hauk, and I'm a junior representing the Public Affairs Conversations Program. In August of 2019, four months before the first COVID outbreak, the Pew Research Center released a report saying that, quote, 
partisan differences in overall views of and trust in scientists occur primarily for environmental scientists. According to that same report, 70% of Democrats trusted environmental health experts to be competent and present fair findings in 2019, while only 40% of Republicans felt the same way. This trust disparity was emphasized by the finding that, in that year, no partisan influence was found concerning our trust in medical scientists. Today, we sit amid a global pandemic, where most of us can agree that our attitudes toward medical science and epidemiology have become a bit more strained. In your recent Wall Street Journal article, you acknowledge the idea that people will more readily lose trust in science during a crisis when we've already lost trust in it during past crises. My question is, when COVID became a crisis, do you think that our past partisan views of environmental scientists could have partially opened the door to new partisan attitudes toward medical scientists, such as epidemiologists? Thank you. <clears throat> it's a very good question. Um, yes, I, I do, because some of the, <clears throat> you probably won't remember this, but in the early days when um, global warming was establishing itself in the public mentality, um, people who had some doubt on some aspects of the consensus, you, you know, the, the speed at which it was happening, how good the models were, were actually kicked off journals. Now, the, you know, as peer reviewers. Now, the whole reason that science works is that there are peer reviewers and people who are supposed to object. If you kick out people who object or disagree from that very process, then the very thing that produced that makes science different, that it has to stand up to counter arguments and, and you know, new suggestions for new experiments, has lost. It becomes a dogma. And people, people saw this happening a lot. People say it's so important that we have to, yeah, c cut a few corners here and claim things that are certain that aren't, aren't true. I remember, you know, the predictions that are absolutely certain that the, you know, I forget by what year, 2010, the, um, there would be no more <clears throat> ice in the Himalayas. That, you know, island nations, but, but 10 years ago would be underwater. Well, if you claim that is certain science and it turns out to be false, what would a reasonable person say? One conclusion would be the one I would draw and then say those claims are not scientific to begin with. But it might also be of some that I can't trust those people who claim to speak for science. That's what then you get. What, then when you have a, an epidemic where people, you know, spokesmen are not careful to, to speak purely as scientific, let their political prejudices out. For example, when, when the CDC is shown that when writing its guidelines for schools, it allows the American Federation of Teachers to have input in how those guidelines are written, that's they are not epidemiologists in the American Federation of Teachers. They're clearly allowing a political process <clears throat> to, into what will then be a claim to be scientific basis. People are not stupid. They see that this is happening. And the tragedy is that they then lose, they don't know how to tell the real science from the pseudoscience. It's perfectly understandable if they don't. And that's the horror because we really need to trust the real science. Thank you, Gary. Uh, here's a question now from Professor Emily Mole of the Biology and Education Department at St. Olaf College. She's also a member of the um, Institute Directors Council. Here is her question. In your article, Partisan Science in America, you argue that those who, uh, quote, those who claim to claim that to doubt any part of the consensus is to be anti-science or a denier are themselves being unscientific, end of quote. While I agree that skepticism and openness to changing ideas are central to scientific thinking, I also perceive anti-scientific thinking to be present in American culture. Blind trust in science is dangerous, but so is science denial. Do you see evidence of anti-science and science denial in American culture, politics, and media? If so, to what do you attribute it? Well, I don't know what you mean by science denial. Um, if you mean people who simply, you know, you know, <clears throat> don't accept Newton's laws, I don't see any evidence of that. People who, for example, don't necessarily accept <clears throat> evolutionary theory, they, <clears throat> that, that's, there are certainly some of those. Um, but science <clears throat> denial is a term very often used for people 
who are scientist skeptical, not science skeptical. And you, you skeptical of, you know, <clears throat> well, let's say that this California law, you know, the, a physician who said, I'm not so sure that, you know, holding children out of school <clears throat> for so long is good science can lose his license now. That's where, that's real science denial. <clears throat> it's claiming otherwise, <clears throat> it's claiming that the physician is, you know, denying science who says that, but the real denial of science is the people who are thinking this way. You know, the ones who are genuinely, <clears throat> who reject physics, <clears throat> basic, <clears throat> the, the basic sciences are small and uninfluential. But the, those 40 or 50% who are skeptical now, they're not skeptical of science. They're skeptic, skeptical of the claim of science and they have good reason to be because the scientists are letting us down. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. Uh, next video question, please. Hello, Professor Morrison. My name is Josh Nierengarten, and I'm a senior here at St. Olaf. And my question for you deals with a former faculty member of Northwestern, Professor Alice Dreger. Professor Dreger resigned after university demanded that she remove an article from the bioethics journal, The Atrium, which she co-edited. So I ask you what can be done by career academics and students to push back against censorship by institutions of higher learning. Thank you. I don't know anything about this incident, so I don't know how to comment on you know, on that question. Yeah, I think um, there's a few years ago, Alice Drager was associated with some Northwestern uh, bio, I, I think it was an historian of sci history of science uh, office or something. And someone had, she was, it was a journal associated with it. And someone public, if I've got this right, someone published an article um, or she published an article, her journal published an article in which um, there was some reference to um, medical personnel bringing patients to sexual satisfaction. It was a, it was a kind of an empirical claim. Um, and it was quite, you know, um, uh, titillating, I suppose, in some sense. Um, but uh, the judgment was made that this was part of a, um, an important argument. Um, and so uh, then there was pressure from the administration to back off or something like that. Anyway, that, that I think is the uh, incident that's being referred to here. <clears throat> well, well, you know, the fact that a claim is titillating is, is, has no bearing on whether it is scientifically reputable. You know, if her experiment, you know, if it's, you know, her data was good, if her, if, you know, her, her whatever techniques you used to establish it were good, well, then they were good. And the way you answer it is by criticizing her techniques or by doing, you know, a counter study. You don't do it. You don't criticize. If they were bad, then you criticize it for bad science. But the fact that it's titillating is irrelevant. Right. Yeah, just to make clear, Alice Drager was the, as I'm recalling now, I might be wrong about this, is the editor of the journal, and she was not the author of the article uh, or the study. Uh, in any oh. event, uh, the, the, your, your general point still holds. Uh, here's another question, um, uh, textual question from Lizzie Quist, class of 25. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, mistrust in science has become especially apparent and problematic. Do you have any ideas about how trust and respect for science can be repaired? How can we ensure that political officials are not making false claims in the name of science that tarnish the reputations of scientists? <clears throat> Well, there are two things we can do. The first thing is we can be informed ourselves as to when a claim can't be scientific. <clears throat> For example, suppose, you know, when our president claims our policy is just following the science, it, you should stop from it cannot be true. Science can tell you if you do this, perhaps how many people will, you know, be infected, but it can't give you the trade-offs as to whether it's worth it you know, to have so many fewer people sick than to keep children out of school and what all the effects it's going to have on them. You know, they, you, their policy, uh, the policy may use the science, but it has to take into account social factors, <clears throat> moral factors, which are not part of the science. So the first thing you have to do is realize that when any politician <clears throat> or even any scientist claims our policy is following the science, they're lying or they don't understand what they're doing. <clears throat> more likely the latter. Um, the second, so we can become better informed. And the second thing is scientists themselves need to police the claims of science made by themselves and politicians in their name. If someone says, speaks, you know, say, 
go on the air to say, Morrison claims this, Morrison claims that, and I didn't claim it, I will intervene and say, sorry, I didn't claim it. Scientists need to do the same thing. They need to say, sorry, yes, and this supports my political opinion, but it's not what I say, it's not science, right? It's not science. Um, we need, if the scientists don't do that, they are the ones principally to blame for the lack of trust in science. Thank you, Gary. Next video question, please. Hello, my name is Nancy Navajiri Mutete. I'm a sophomore and I'm asking a question on the behalf of the Public Affairs Conversation Program. In your piece from the Wall Street Journal about partisan science in America, you argued that one must argue for and against the social or political implications of a scientific discovery in the same way as for any social or political ideas. My question is, if we tend to rely on political leaders who are backed by scientific data because we're unable to fully understand science, how can the general public better form social or political judgment on scientific data when they don't have prior scientific knowledge? Thank you. Well, uh, you know, I, I wonder why you think that politicians are better informed about science than you can be. I <clears throat> say the most fundamental things to recognize when a scientific claim is wrong, you don't need any knowledge of science to do. You need to recognize it's a social claim being, you know, claimed as part of a science. <clears throat> and if you are going to trust, you know, the scientific authorities, they have to prove themselves trustworthy that they're speaking for science and not, for example, allowing a teacher's union to write rules that will then be presented as based on science. Once they do that, of course you can't trust them. And then we're up the creek because there's no, you're, you're absolutely right. There would be no one to trust. <clears throat> Since we can't be an expert in each science, even one scientist has to trust other scientists in, in, in other fields. And if they prove themselves untrustworthy, and certainly, you know, our authorities did during, during this pandemic, um, what happens in the next pandemic? People think, well, you know, we had to save all these lives. So, we, you know, we had to lie. We had to, you know, Dr. Fauci, you know, with those masks, we had to lie because it was good. Don't you take into account that when you destroy trust in what you say in your authority, speak for science <clears throat> as a spokesman for it. So people believe you that the next time you will have no trust. That's what has happened in this pandemic. And the next one, we will be in terrible state because people will not trust it. And suppose, you know, scientists come in, you know, it's a Republican administration and they start claiming, of course, are Democrats going to trust what Republican scientists say if the recommendations are not what they would want? You see, nobody will trust it at all except as to whether they already agree with it politically. And that's not, that destroys any benefit you have from science. It just becomes another piece of political rhetoric and that it shouldn't be that way. Science stands above politics. It's just what's true in the way mathematics does. And we've lost that because of the scientists and the people who claim to speak for science misrepresenting what the science is as what they, the policies they would like it to be. Thank you, Gary. Next uh, video question, mm -hmm. please. The, hi, this is Caroline Fairbanks, a sophomore representing PACON 281B. In Partisan Science in America, you state that you believe essentially that it is the fault of scientists that much of the public does not trust them. Well, I can understand a certain amount of skepticism and distrust being warranted, especially given that scientific theories and hypotheses change over time. It seems to me that this may have gotten a little out of hand, especially as it pertains to certain childhood vaccinations such as measles, and specifically the MMR vaccine, where one of the most common criticisms of the scientific community is that they will not say for sure that it does not cause autism. In essence, they are doing the opposite in this case of what you have uh, said is a major problem. They are not just saying that they are absolutely right. And I was wondering whether you think it is actually possible for the scientific community to 
gain trust with people who do not um, have it currently. Maybe also what that trust would look like and how necessary it is, whether it would actually be a good thing. Thank you. <clears throat> Those are all just wonderful questions. Um, um, <clears throat> you are certainly right that there are people, <clears throat> have been people, I've, I've met them, you know, whose you know, well, skepticism of <clears throat> anything, you know, medical treatment, vaccine, on grounds that if you probe them seem well, there's certainly not good scientific objection to what's going on. There certainly are such people. I imagine every society has them. They may be deriving, you know, their ideas from <clears throat> a particular um, <clears throat> metaphysics, <clears throat> religious or, or, or not, you know, I, I don't know. But um, <clears throat> there will always be some of those. And you probably are not going to win those over no matter what you do. <clears throat> but there are very few of those, I think, compared to the number of really skeptical people now. <clears throat> Look, if I, if I talk about myself, <clears throat> I got myself, you know, both vaccines and I've had two booster shots, but I, I realized I didn't do it because Dr. Fauci or the CDC recommended, because I don't trust the word they said. <clears throat> I did it because uh, I happen to know from science friends of mine what it takes to get a drug approved what the pharmaceutical industry has to go through in order to get it approved, it's, it's not perfect, but it's very rigorous. And they have a very good track record in my lifetime of developing good drugs. And I trusted it for that reason. You understand? But it's perfectly reasonable now. Many people who would believe the scientists, a vast number, are not believing them because of how the scientists behave. <clears throat> are there some who, no matter how well the scientists behave, wouldn't believe? Yes. There are, and you know that you just have to live with it in every society. But we could reduce it to that number rather than expand it to what we've got now. Thank you, Gary. This is a question now from Adam Delegue. Um, Dr. Morrison, in an article from October of last year, you claim that public trust in science had been degraded by the misrepresentations and intentional omissions of scientists such as Dr. Fauci during the pandemic. The pandemic has also forced scientific institutions such as the CDC into unknown new territory in terms of their regulatory powers, powers that are recently being legally challenged, such as the travel mask mandate. Would you support returning regulatory powers to political institutions rather than having public facing scientists such as Dr. Fauci be responsible for politicized public health decisions? Yes. I mean, the, Dr. Fau the CDC should be in a position of recommending measures. But since they have social, like keeping children out of school, which are not their expertise, right? And they should be making the recommendations. And then people, you know, who are in authority should discuss them and debate them and present their reasons to the public <clears throat> and then <clears throat> enact them by, by legislation, right? Um, just to give unlimited authority over, let's say, school children to people whose expertise might be in, you know, a particular strain of a, a virus is a very peculiar idea. And it's not a good one. It's simply not a good one. And it will produce mistrust in anything those people say because they're claiming their science knows things that it doesn't know, like how to treat school children. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next video question, please. So as we have seen with COVID, when faced with an issue like a pandemic, people can react very irrationally and panic. And I think this is one of the few times when we really saw partisan science at play, when scientific claims are made for the purpose of reinforcing a policy, which some, some that are working towards keeping other people safe, um, I was just curious to hear what other alternatives could there be in order to maintain scientific transparency, but also keep people safe, for example. Well, we, we don't know exactly how to keep people safe. I mean, we don't. I mean, we, and we never will perfectly. What we have is good guesses based on past experience, <clears throat> but we've never had, you know, a complete lockdown, you know, like this. It's the claim that this is scientifically 
certain when it's never been done before is extremely peculiar to begin with. You know, science is based on verification. It hasn't been verified. Obviously, you can't claim that. Um, you have to present to the public what you know, <clears throat> your degree of confidence in it, that is how certain you are and what might upset it. Well, listen, maybe there's a better way of ventilating, you know, um, patients than, than the ventilator. Maybe it is too. You don't really know. And you say, this is our best guess at the moment. It's revisable. And you distinguish that from things which are not just a best guess, like, you know, the DNA of the virus, let's say, right? Um, and then you make clear the basis of how certain you are. And then, you know, if, you, if something that you say is not, terribly certain, just the best guess turns out to be wrong. Nobody's going to lose faith in it. That's what you said to begin with. So it's the matching your claims to your confidence, which is to say you cannot treat science as an equally certain block. You have to present it honestly to the public. The public will recognize dishonesty that is overstatement, um, <clears throat> like in that sign in Glacier National Park. Um, they will recognize it and maybe draw too strong conclusions from it, as I think they have in some cases, um, <clears throat> both here and in environmental science. But it's not even unreasonable for them to do so, even if the conclusions they've drawn are wrong. Thank you, Gary. Here's a question from an alum of St. Olaf College, Tom Sibley, Tom Sibley, excuse me, class of 1973, one year younger than I am, uh, from St. Joseph, uh, Minnesota. Here's the question. Some partisan science casts doubt on well-established experimental science. For instance, some climate change doubters will question some aspect of climate science to block the well-established evidence of human causes of climate change. This doesn't sound like fundamentalism, yet functions to undermine science. Is this a variation on partisan scientific fundamentalism? I if I understood you, I think what you said was to block measures based on to block um, the, to, to block the well excuse me to block the well established evidence of human causes of climate change. <clears throat> but you don't you don't block evidence. You he must mean she must mean block <clears throat> the conclusions you're going to draw from the evidence. You don't block evidence. It's something peculiar. I don't quite get. I, I think what they mean is they're trying to prevent measures based on well-established methods of, uh, <clears throat> of sciences. And then <clears throat> once their measure is based on it, and then you understand these are not strictly themselves scientific. What human beings will, <clears throat> will, will block <clears throat> is the best way to um, reduce carbon in the atmosphere to <clears throat> eliminate nuclear power, as they did in Germany or to foster nuclear power, as they did in Finland, because it's, it's, it's no carbon. Is it to um, eliminate all fossil fuels or to switch to natural gas, as, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, because it emits less carbon than oil <clears throat> and coal? These are policy recommendations that will depend on the economics of I it, mean, on what choices people will, will be willing to tolerate, what other consider as a nuclear power, for example. <clears throat> yes, zero. Uh, zero emissions, but other problems, which are not in the, a, a climate science issue, but other comes from other science. All these things have to be balanced. And, and to simply say, the science tells us what to do, that's where the problem is. The science gives us information on which we can base a rational decision. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next video question, please. Hello, my name is Eli, and I'm asking a question on behalf of the Public Affairs Conversation. In your article, Partisan Science in America, you claim that the greatest danger to the public's trust in science comes from scientists who either speak publicly in the name of science when they are not qualified to do so, or fail to correct others' misrepresentations of science. However, aside from the examples of the Lancet scientists and Dr. Fauci you cite in your article, there seems to be a far greater number of politicians, journalists, and pundits who speak publicly on scientific matters without qualification than scientists. And generally, scientists seem to have a less public role in political discussion, as well as less direct influence in policymaking. How do you generalize the claim that scientists are the greatest threat 
to the public's trust in science and not politicians, journalists, or pundits that perpetuate misinformation and spread their own political narrative. Thank you. Oh, so the pundits have a great deal to, to blame too. <clears throat> you know, yes, I, I say there are more, I don't know. The proportion of iniquity is probably equally divided, you know, between them. Um, but when the politicians speak <clears throat> in the name of science and the scientists know that they are not really speaking science and they ought to know, then if they want people to trust science, they have to speak to us. Sorry. Sorry. You know, we have all these quote unquote fact checks and why don't the scientists say, look, you know, yes, what he said has some science behind it, but when he went way beyond the science of making him claiming that the policy recommendation was based on the science or no, he got the science somewhat wrong. He, and he or he claimed a degree of certainty that we don't have yet, that we were doing our best. That's what the scientists need to do if they want people to trust science and they don't because and there's very good reasons they don't, <clears throat> because their prestige is enhanced by these claims. Are they going to diminish their own prestige? <clears throat> Aside from the fact, if it's a very touchy public political issue, <clears throat> they could have their career blackballed by other people within the science who are willing to force a view upon it. And the more politicized a scientific question is, the more that will be true within the science. It's not going to be true in astronomy, I imagine. <clears throat> as so much as it might be in something that has an immediate policy um, implication. <clears throat> and then the person will have to be very careful. Or, you know, scientists depend on research grants. Who is sitting on those committees? Are they trying to, f that gives out the grants, are they trying to force particular conclusions on people because they think it's for the public good? When things like that happen, scientists have to speak up for science. <clears throat> And the scientific societies have to do that as well as individuals and they aren't doing it and they will have only themselves to blame that people lose faith in science but they may have only themselves to blame but everyone will suffer if science is no longer trusted thank you gary uh here's a question from nick Layden uh from eau claire wisconsin for a scientist, is there ever a time when the ends justify the means? Meaning, is there ever a reason to justify misrepresenting information data? No. <clears throat> then you're not a scientist. Simple, very simple. Would you say that, uh, would you, if I could follow up on that, would you say the same thing about a political leader? What would I say? Um, that's, yeah, would, would there be circumstances where you say, well, a, sci a scientist stops being a scientist when, when they stop telling the truth? Of course a politician is going to lie. But the old diplomacy is lying. Of course politicians have to lie. They're not scientists. All right, so the <laughs> argument, yeah, all right, so the argument, I'm just the, I was going to say, just the, your argument then against the scientists uh, uh, disguising the truth uh, or not yes. telling the truth is because he's a scientist, but you are open to the possibility that a political leader Let's say the political reader knows something about, uh, or has heard heard some science, and uh, heard, let's let's say a political leader saying what Dr. Fauci said, because he wants to hold, you know, he wants to keep a certain number of masks in reserve um, uh, for those uh, who who need the most. Uh, that would be permitted from your point of view, in a way that it's not permitted for the science. It would be it would still be a bad thing to do it just wouldn't be quite as bad thing to do because at least if the politician is doing it the scientist could come in and say oh wait a minute here you know the scientist would have could act a correct on it you know on that <clears throat> look we live in a real world of course politicians salesmen businessmen don't reveal everything <laughs> to conclude from that that scientists should misrepresent their data <clears throat> is to reduce science to nothing but another to use car salesmen, you know, <clears throat> we we all suffer if you do that. Well, we suffer when we we suffer when we're trying to buy a car too. <laughs> and the used car salesman is not telling us the truth about the car. So I, I mean, there there are right. all sorts of you know there are all sorts of things we we might say about telling the truth and um, allowing for fudging in various <laughs> kinds of ways. But again, what I hear you say is that. There's something about the scientific enterprise which makes it especially important for scientists to tell the truth and not to misinform. 
Whereas in the case of business or political leaders, you know, there it's, it's a little more complex. That's what I'm hearing you say now. It's a different set of questions that are involved. And, you know, <clears throat> the only ones I was addressing here about, about the science, the questions about the degree of truthfulness in government and diplomacy, these are interesting questions, but they're not at all what I'm talking about here. Okay, good, thank you. Next video question, please. Good evening, Professor Morrison. My name is Ethan Ormerod, and I'm a senior studying both chemistry and economics here at St. Olaf. As an economics student, I'm particularly interested in the laws behind cause and effect and how certain policy proposals can have certain counterintuitive effects, such as Anthony Fauci's original statement um, saying that masks were not effective in order to reduce the demand for masks since there was a supply shortage and we wanted to focus masks um, being sent into you know high risk areas such as hospitals and then this later being uh, having the consequences of maybe people being hesitant towards the actual effectiveness of masks later in the pandemic where it was more necessary additionally as a chemistry student I also sometimes struggle with people's hesitancy to accept scientific information, such as vaccines, um, and understanding the safety behind that. So my question is, to what extent is the communication of scientific information, to what extent is that burden put upon the scientists in being able to communicate uh, information effectively? You've talked a lot about trust. But to what extent does that also rely on citizens or even public figures who are criticizing this information and need to know how to properly criticize and question. Thank you for your time. Yes, I mean, the scientists happen to make clear what the evidence for what they're doing is. <clears throat> it would be very good if we actually had journalists who understood the science and based and were able to translate the information. So, but unfortunately, our journalists just decided, you know, <clears throat> What would be interesting to people? What would make a good story? What would, <clears throat> what fits their the narrative they already have? We we don't have that, and that's a a, a significant failure of the journalistic profession right now. <clears throat> you know they really need to step up too, and then people will understand. But you know if somebody says, well, you know I question the effectiveness of the vaccine. It ought to be possible for that person to say, well, <clears throat> what's the evidence that the vaccine works? Well, we've done these controlled experiments, right? Right, And this is what you know, the result of these experiments are. That's why we believe in the, you know, in the vaccine. <clears throat> you know, if, are we 100% certain? Well, no, because sometimes vaccines do, when they're marketed, turn out to have effects years later. But, you know, it's rare. And you say things like that. Here's the evidence. Here's how certain we are, right? If you claim, I'm sorry, there's no possibility this could ever, you know, <clears throat> have a negative effect, then people will know right away that you're claiming something that couldn't be true. You have a new technology. You don't know its effect is going to be 30 years down the road. Nobody has tested. How could you? you that's a case where you know it couldn't have scientific evidence behind it. That's why the scientists have to say, here's the evidence we have. Here's our best guess. It seems pretty good to us for these reasons. Is it absolutely certain? No, but, you know. <clears throat> this is what we. This is the the best we can do, and it's pretty good. That's what the scientist needs to do. Thank you, Gary. This question from Andy Harrison, class of twenty three. Would it not be more appropriate to argue against any one person or scientist being put on a pedestal to represent all of scientific knowledge, rather than denouncing scientists having any authority at all on social and political matters? <clears throat> scientists should not have authority on <clears throat> social matters because they're not experts on social matters. They don't know any more about, <clears throat> you know, an epidemiologist knows nothing more about elementary education than I do. <clears throat> and there's no reason to, you know, put them, you know, to, to treat them as the authority. And D, should we not put the Dr. Fauci or other people out on a pedestal? Yes, of course. It'll go to anybody's head if you, if, if you, if you treat them like that. They'll think, well, I think so. So it must be true because I'm the spokesman for science, right? As, as he said, if you doubt me, you doubt science. <clears throat> you, you hear that and you know that this is a person who has lost his head, who couldn't possibly be. You don't trust a word he says after a comment like that. 
Thank you, Gary. Here is a question now from uh, Professor Justin Merritt, who is also the Assistant Director of the Institute for Freedom and Community. Uh, politicians, businesses, and regulatory agencies want to borrow on the prestige and trust built up over 400 years of scientific pro progress. We are rightly suspicious when a study funded by the Peanut Council finds peanuts to be super healthy. Should we be equally suspicious when a study funded by, say, the NIH supports the policy goals of the regime that provides its funding? <coughs> That's a good question. And I think the answer is you have to e examine what the actual <laughs> procedures of the NIH would be, <clears throat> open it to criticism from people who think there's a problem, evaluate those criticisms. <clears throat> it may, I don't have any opinion about this what, whatsoever. I haven't looked at it. Um, <clears throat> and then you examine it on the case, <clears throat> you know, based on the evidence of the case. Um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, yes, in any case where, you know, Somebody, if the NIH, has, you know, if, if the NIH has a strong policy in a particular area, they will only fund grants that comes support a particular scientific point of view. And will not admit evidence on the other side because of its policy, social policy, and then, then you know to be suspicious in that area and perhaps other areas. <clears throat> but I don't know. But is that true? That you have to be careful of before you say it's true. <clears throat> you have to really have the evidence. I certainly don't have any such evidence. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next video question, please. Hello, my name is Pumele Lemina, a sophomore currently doing the public affairs conversation. You argue that in order for scientists to gain public interest, they need to present scientific data against the social or political implications. My question is, how do you ensure that you are able to keep these worlds apart when they're so interconnected? And secondly, where do you draw the line? <coughs> Well, I mean, the, the line between the social and the scientific implications. Well, this, the scientific expert will be based on concrete experiments and, you know, um, repeated experiments to verify within the science and will draw certain specific conclusions about the reproduction rate of the, of the virus, how spreadable it is, about any number of questions. The conclusion you draw about <clears throat> what to do about that in society, how to change people, want to spend money, what restrictions on human beings, those become, those are policy ones because they involve, they're not in the actual science itself. That's where the line is. Thank you, Gary. Uh, another question from Nick Layden of Eau Claire. Do you believe that there is a direct relationship between scientific illiteracy and the tendency to be persuaded by pseudoscience? If so, if a reasonable goal seems to be to decrease the reach and persuasion of pseudoscience in this vein, how would you enhance scientific literacy in society? You know, I would. I don't know that that premise is true. I don't know if it's false, but <clears throat> the fundamentalists I encounter in the university who will simply deny any evidence that doesn't fit <clears throat> you know, their predisposed belief are not necessarily scientifically illiterate. They have a mindset that they know in advance what they have to say. And scientific literacy will not cure that. <clears throat> something else, a, a belief in open-mindedness, understanding of the process of science and why it's important, <clears throat> it will do that. <clears throat> Scientific literacy <clears throat> would indeed be a, a great thing <clears throat> um, for society, but you know, what it can't be is a serious science presented as, a, as it sometimes is, you know, in high school textbooks, let's say even college, <clears throat> as a series of permanent dogmas permanently established. When you do things like that, you have it. You give people the wrong idea. You should have people, well, what made, instead of just printing the dogma, you say, what were the experiments that established this? What other hypotheses were entertained? Why were they rejected? What sort of evidence would have us change this uh, uh, belief for another one? That's how you teach scientific literacy, not, not just particular theories. And if science is, you know, in, in high school and college were taught that way, um, you probably bring it together with a little bit of a history of science, with the actual experience in a lab of what you're doing. Um, 
people, there'd be more scientific literacy. And we need journalists who are act, who are trained this way and know how to communicate to ordinary people. <clears throat> what you get in you know the mass newspaper and the best of them is simply terrible. Yeah, thank you, Gary. That that actually connects to the next question. This by Nat uh, Natalie Choi, class of twenty. 22 from the biomedical ethics class. To what extent do you think the public has responsibility in assessing partisan science? What concrete actions can be taken by the general public? <clears throat> well, the, you know, the public could make clear <clears throat> that they really want to know what the science is and they want the scientists <clears throat> to step up and do their responsibility and distinguish the science from the pseudoscience and to keep their own you know, social opinions out of their assessment of what the scientific evidence is. People need to press that. They need to be, you know, <clears throat> press it on school boards and they need to press it on, you know, <clears throat> trustees can press it on, you know, <clears throat> in, in, in colleges and universities. That science is a value <clears throat> way beyond any immediate policy that, that's on the horizon. That science has a value in itself that you know has proven itself over centuries it's so valuable we have to preserve it from political and other corruption thank you gary uh this is from curtis johnson class of 86 from webster minnesota would not a rotating jury of scientists who review and provide support uh and the financial promotion of the sciences would that be better than the corporate and the dod support of a given science well, supposedly we have that, you know, in scientific journals and peer review, um, and the people who sit on, on grant agencies are this, um, <clears throat> you know, um, the funding, I, I don't know anything, what to say about the funding, because I, I haven't looked into that. But certainly, um, the integrity of the peer review process, the evaluation process, <clears throat> once a journal has decided, yes, you know, the, we published this because the evidence supported, but now we realize it hurt people's sensitivities and we're going to withdraw it. That journal should be shut and never, uh, and never looked at again because it can't be trusted. Thank you, Gary. This is from Abigail Hollinger, class of 2023 from Northfield. There are many individuals who do not believe trust in science and instead believe conspiracy theories and misinformation. Examples, Earth is flat, anti-vaxxers. How do you suggest we, society, professionals, reporters, et cetera, tackle this problem? How do we change someone's mind when they're fully convinced that their understanding is factually correct, even though the correct fact has been proven? What do you suggest when pure logic, scientific evidence is not enough to convince someone? Someone, excuse me. You know, I'm really interested that the example you picked was flat earth. There's I guarantee you have never met a person who believed in a flat earth. And once people start saying people I disagree with are flat earthers, you know you're painting with a much too broad brush. And then when your phrase is anti-vaxxer, does that include people who just reject vaccination entirely? Or is it people who wonder whether you need a fourth booster? They couldn't call them all anti-vaxxers because they're all flat earth. The way you phrase the question suggests that the, there's a problem in that there's a fundamentalism behind in the mindset behind the way you phrase that question. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. Uh, we are approaching uh, the end of our time, the end of our session. And I was wondering, uh, Gary, is there anything uh, that has not been addressed related to the topic that you would like to leave us with before we um, um, end our conversation? Yes. Uh, you know, it, this would be, um, <clears throat> you know, a, rel a relatively minor point, but um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I sometimes hear is, well, what's the evidence for this? And the evidence is a computer model. But you said a computer model is a model. It's not evidence. It's no more evidence than diagram on a piece of paper. The model has to be verified by actual, whether <clears throat> testing its actual predictions. But the word computer is so magical now that all you have to do is say, we have a computer model and people think it's science. It's sort of similar like just write it as an equation and people think it's science. <laughs> people need to understand, and scientists need to help them understand where, how science works, why it's more convincing than just mere opinion, 
and therefore, you know, because <clears throat> because it can be tested, it can be verified, because people are invited to do counter experiments, to repeat experiments. If it becomes just mere opinion, if opinion replaces that, because it's good to have a certain conclusion, then what gives, what makes science science, what makes it different from what I do, literary criticism, is lost. And that's so valuable, we need to preserve it and defend it. And I think we all have a role in it. We all need to make clear that this is what we want. <clears throat> that we want to train our journalists better. We want to call upon our scientists and actually to be careful and say, this is what we demand of our public officials as well. And then we will be able to trust in the next pandemic or crisis what, this, what we are told. Thank you, Gary. This seems like uh, a good point to end our uh, conversation. Thanks to the audience for joining us tonight in this stimulating conversation with Professor Gary Saul Morrison. And thanks so much to you, Gary, for our lively exchange on partisan science and other fundamentalisms. Hey, that's just one wonderful students. It was a, a joy to hear. Thank you so much. Our event this evening concludes our Institute's spring series on contemporary controversies. This series has expressed with some power what the St. Olaf College Institute for Freedom and Community is all about. Free and open critical inquiry that invites, without reservation, the civil expression of reasonable ideas, even those with which we may disagree profoundly. In America today, and indeed in the world, sorry to say, academic freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of speech are all under siege. Support such freedom where you can. Don't take it for granted. Don't turn away from it, even for a moment, because if you do, someday you may turn back around and find that freedom gone. But for now, hopefully, be well and do the right thing as hard as it may be to do it in solidarity with all those committed to freedom and community. Good night and goodbye. <laughs>